Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh, your host here in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I have the pleasure once again of talking with Nathan Jishin Mishon, who is based in Kyoto. Thanks so much for joining, Nathan. Thank you for having me. Now, the first time you joined, uh, we talked a little bit about your research and your amazing book talking about crisis care and Buddhism. Uh, you've been studying and practicing Buddhism for quite a few years in Japan, isn't that right? Um, yeah, I, I guess total around 20 years, but <laughs> um, my, my first time staying in a Japanese monastery was probably back in 2002, I think. <laughs> so. Wow, quite a long time. And today, I, I'm so glad you could join today because at the end of the year, like we're at now, a lot of people are visiting shrines and temples in Japan. Yes. And you're going to tell us a little bit about things to look for and even give us a little bit of meditation practice, maybe, uh, yeah. to help us connect more with these ideas. So I'm so happy to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, uh, in terms of a deeper experience, Kyoto is one of the top destinations, of course, uh, for many international and domestic travelers. And they visit the most famous temples and shrines and as you've been guiding as well, you're trying to give people a deeper, more meaningful experience. And we had the chance to travel together to Miyajima and go to amazing Daishoin Temple. So I'm sure a lot of the things you're going to be talking about today can be applied to any temple or shrine visit around Japan. There's probably a lot of similarities with things yeah. that you'll explain, yeah. right? Many similarities. <laughs> Not everything is everywhere, but <laughs> well, let's let's dive right in. You've sent me some beautiful photos. Uh, let's start with these Buddha's feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of not everything being everywhere, you, you won't find these everywhere, but um, they are sometimes like off in some corner or some particular spot of a temple. Um, for example, like Kiyomizu Dera, one of the most popular, the most popular, most visited temple of Kyoto. Uh, they're a little off as, on a side, you have to kind of peek around and look, um, but there are these big Buddha's feet <laughs> right there. Um, and they are representation of Buddha's feet. And this actually is like one of the longest um, symbols of Buddhism in Buddhist history, dating back to some of the earliest days in India. Um, and so back then, it was actually very uncommon. Uh, there weren't Buddha statues. And so Buddha was only represented by certain symbols and the feet were one of the most common ones. And so that kind of carried over to today as well. Um, but these images of two feet often represent the Buddha himself and his teachings. In Daishoin, in the main temple, they have uh, Buddha's feet in different areas. But one of the interesting ones is they have with incense underneath. And if you stand on Buddha's feet and then you get the incense going on your feet as well, I thought that was an interesting deviation. So yeah. are you supposed to stand on Buddha's feet? Um, it it depends and some some of the variations they're set up in that way otherwise they're they can also be on a platform or kind of vertical so you're looking at them so there's a lot of little variations from temple to temple i noticed that when uh japanese people were standing on the ones at daishoin and there is a sutra or a chant that they're supposed to be reading as they're standing there 
Um, it was missed by me and other people who couldn't read it. Um, <laughs> but is, is that common to stand in certain places and to do a chant or uh, recite a sutra, is that right? Yeah, especially, well, um, like in Japan, typically the more uh, Shingon temples or Tendai, um, there's many, many different types of Buddhism, uh, not just in Japan, but of course the world. And in Japan, we could probably narrow them down to especially three different forms. Uh, so the most common around are the Pure Land temples. And um, these are basically about the idea behind it was that there's many, many different um, Buddhas in the world, in the cosmos, because Buddha simply means awakened one, and anyone can be awakened. So <laughs> the Buddha isn't just one Buddha, but there can be many. And so this idea kind of developed and formed that, uh, especially throughout the whole cosmos, through the history of the universe, uh, there must be many, many Buddhas, right? And one of these kind of cosmic Buddhas who's also represented is called Amitabha or Amida in Japanese. And Amida made this wonderful all-embracing vow that anyone who wishes to um, be reborn in this, what do you call it, a pure land that he would create, um, they could be essentially, it was, it's like this heavenly perfect realm land that is set up so anyone there could be an enlightened, awakened. And um, so just have to focus on um, Amida, Amitabha, and ideally chant his name as well. So it is a kind of mantra. Um, but in some ways, it's a lot easier because in, it's like there's a lot of these other Buddhist practices that could be really, really hard <laughs> to do. But if you don't want to focus too much on that, just focus on Amitabha and move, move the bigger goal to the next life. Um, so um, just for now, focus on Amitabha. And that kind of Buddhism in some ways is, is much easier. So this became the most popular kind of Buddhism in Japan and what you see as most of the temples. Is, um, there, is there an image that we have of Amitabha? Um, yeah, it, <laughs> it is a little later on, but if, if you had a way and you wanted to skip over to that now, um, I think the next slide or two. Uh, one more, maybe. You know, oh, just after this would be. Yep. <laughs> one more, maybe. How many images? Sorry. This one? Um, yeah, this one is Amitabha. <laughs> so. Um, How can you tell it's Amitabha? Are there de de defining features? Good question. For one, um, this one lists below <laughs> on his name. Amida Nyorai. So um, Amida is the Japanese for Amitabha, but um, Amida is often holding his hand up like this. Um, in other ways, it, he can also be a central figure of some of these temples. And so we just know, okay, this is Amida Buddha. Um, otherwise, it it's, Amida can look very similar to some other ones. So it is a little bit tricky sometimes as well. Um, the, hand gestures, the hand gestures are always so interesting to look at of the different yeah, statues, they, right? They <laughs> um, and they each have their own different meanings too. So here 
is he going like this? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the a okay teaching. Sign, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is a, a teaching mudra, actually. So it um, it means that he's conveying or the teachings of Buddhism. Wow. Us. And then this one, uh, you talked about this one in a short video at Daishoin, holding <laughs> the finger, right? Yeah. A kind of interesting mudra. So this one gets into this different form of Buddhism, uh, which gets a lot more complicated, uh, what we call in English, sometimes esoteric Buddhism or Mikyo in Japanese. And this figure is called Dainichi in Japanese, Dainichi Nyorai. And so in the Japanese name, it basically means big sun or big light, grand light. And as opposed to like the historical Buddha who actually offered these teachings, uh, was born and was a real human on this earth uh, 2,500 or so years ago. That, as opposed to that, Dainichi is more kind of a personification, a symbol of this essence, I guess you could say, uh, of all the light and purity of the universe. And so that's like, the meaning behind this grand light. And so it's all this pure light and goodness that's supposed to be in there within the whole universe and that we can have access to uh, through these practices as well. And so these symbols that come up uh, are what we call mudras, kind of ritual hand gestures in these statues. And I, I think I described a little bit in that video, but um, just in basic summary, there's um, mudras, which are these hand gestures, mantras, the voice and visualizations as well, which are in the practice supposed to represent a purification of body, speech and mind simultaneously. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the most common images you will see at a Buddhist yeah. temple is <laughs> Fudo Myo. Now you described uh, this image to me as tough love. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you so tell us a bit? Yeah. Sure. Um, so Fudo, I, I, I love the figure in some ways because it, it is, at first, it can be so vicious looking even, <laughs> um, fierce looking, and yet the meanings behind Fudo are in some ways so good and so kind as well. Um, so it can be so interesting in that way. Like you say, it's almost like this tough love. And, and whereas Dainichi and these other friendly Buddhas are that warm kind of um, gracious love, uh, Dainichi or Fudo instead is more this like, oh, that kid, the little, your little kid is about to stick a fork in an electric socket or run out into the street chasing a ball and you have to yell stop <laughs> and that is still very much a type of deep embracing love but it is much more fierce <laughs> and so it can also represent like these if you have a bad habit going on or something like that and you need to kind of force that out of you it's that kind of love and care where it's like you see all this fire around fudo um all the time and this fire is burning away those unhealthy habits or actions um so all the greed um, just kind of 
you can even take a moment and imagine that greed that you might find in you or an, an, another type of unhealthy habit just burning away in a sense. Wow. Um, and his sword and lasso, <laughs> what do they symbolize? Um, so honestly, there can be a few slightly different explanations, but the most common one given is the lasso is kind of whoop, catching our unhealthy attachments. <laughs> and that sword cuts the connection to it. <laughs> so uh, there we go away from our unhealthy attachments in that way. Wow. And uh, in this room, it looks like a place to practice uh, tracing sutras. Is that right? Yes, um, which is another really common thing you can see in temples. Um, sometimes they're way off to the side and not as clearly marked for English speakers. Um, but other times they can be more clearly marked. So it really depends. But either way, it's a, a fairly common practice that you'll see. And um, these also, it's a, in many ways a type of mindfulness activity, a type of contemplative activity, where just the, pr the practice of writing the letters um, as you go along really concentrate on um, relaxing the body, relaxing the mind as you focus on the writing and just copying of letter to letter. So it's in many ways a type of moving meditation for those who um, aren't as comfortable with just sitting and just silent sitting. Um, this is also one sort of meditative practice that's available to, uh, to try and can move your hand and just even focus on the feeling of the pen or brush in your hand, how it feels on the paper, and even optionally practice this, like focusing on a type of goodness from your heart, um, flowing into the paper, out into the world um, as you bring your brush through those strokes from one stroke to the other. Um, so yeah, another option of a contemplative practice available in many temples as well. <laughs> yeah, it's something that a lot of tours uh, to famous temple areas will have guests do. And it's a comment that a lot of international guests actually say is, I have no idea what I'm writing. I have no idea how I'm supposed to write it. Um, but what you said just now about making it a meditative mindfulness kind of exercise, it doesn't really matter as long as you're trying to kind of clear your mind and yeah. even, even <laughs> understand it. Is that right? Yeah. If, if you make a mistake or something, don't really worry about that so much. In some ways, worrying about a mistake is almost a distraction in itself. So <laughs> um, just focusing on the relaxing of the mind as you're doing it um, and not worrying too much about the letters themselves is is almost a better way. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I did one recently and I was able to donate it to the sacred fire um, because mm -hmm. I didn't need to keep it. It wasn't mm -hmm. beautiful. And for me, the practice <laughs> of doing it was the reason to do it. It wasn't sure. to get something to take home. I know some people like to take it home. So it's it's nice there's that option, which yeah. brings us to the next photo about the sacred fire. Can you tell us a little bit about the fire ceremony? Yeah, so in Japanese, this is called goma. And it, it actually comes from Indian traditions. It was somewhat adopted into Buddhism from Hindu traditions, so it's called Homa, <laughs> slightly, just a slight difference in pronunciations. Um, but in esoteric Japanese traditions, um, this is very much related to the Fudo type images we just talked about, 
uh, where the fire is representative of this burning away of unhealthy attachments and greeds and also unhealthy aversions as well, such as anger, um, frustrations. And so all of this, in a sense, is being burned away through the contemplation with the flames. And often the goma, uh, not just, it, it can be both for personal, but also as a prayer in some sense for specific people, but also it often stretches out into carrying these themes out into the world. So in some ways, some people summarize it in a nutshell as a, a prayer for world peace, because if you are visualizing and imagining praying for the, the burning away, the erasure of all the world's greed and anger and even ignorance, um, what a wonderful world it would be. <laughs> so um, again, in some ways, this is ultimately basically a, a prayer of meditation on world peace, but just a, a bit of a complex ritual form and visualization, contemplation of doing it. And, and it's really beautiful to see. Yeah, um, the, the when, fire, right? doing it with the fire can be really, really powerful in some ways as well. And people often, they'll write their name or their wish and the monk will say it as they're doing the ceremony and yeah. say their wish as they're burning it. Is that right? Yeah, so they'll often even pass it directly through those flames as they're focusing on that specific prayer or wish of the people. And then it, it sometimes changes fragrance as well? Yes, um, because there are many different little things you put into the flames as well through the ritual. So um, all these different little herbs and plants and spices even. Um, so it can have a number of different fragrances if you're up close to those flames. Yeah, beautiful. I really like uh, being seeing the fire ceremony. And I think at the end of the year or certain times of year, it's, it's a time when people can go in and see the fire ceremony. Or if you stay over in a temple, you can, right? Yeah, um, especially some places like Koyasan, um, there are a few temples there that do fire ceremonies on a daily basis regularly, either every morning or every afternoon. Um, and even some places do it at least fairly regularly um, in uh, Shingon temples around Kyoto or up in Mount Hiei. Uh, so you can find them a number of places around Japan. Now let's look at some of the images you sent uh, looking outside. Are these places sure. in Kyoto? It's so beautiful. Um, yeah, this is uh, um, Arashi no Nembutsuji. So it's in the Arashiyama area in Northwest Kyoto. And these are actually, it, it's, <laughs> it is a beautiful, little temple somewhat out of the way um but it's a really it has some really spectacular little sights to see going through it um and this is a collection these were actually found more in the bamboo forest that's just nearby um it's not the famous bamboo forest in Arashiyama, but there's technically bamboo forest everywhere around Japan. <laughs> so um, not just the famous one. And uh, this little temple has its own and they ended up bringing all of these old gravestones out and collecting them into an area. And all of these actually have special meaning to them as well. And so you can see the different shapes there and it's made up of essentially five different parts 
if you look closely, there's a square on bottom and then a sphere. And yes, here's a closer, a more clear image of that shape. And then it's this kind of funky shape in the middle. Um, another somewhat funky shape, second from top. Often it's represented as a half sphere as well. There you go, another image of it. And then this somewhat pointed image at the very top. And so these are representations also of what's called the five elements. And so on the bottom is earth, and then that sphere is water, and then we have fire, earth, and space. Uh, technically all around the whole thing is a, a hidden sixth element of consciousness, um, but we can also see these represented in like the earlier image you showed of the mudras. So each finger can represent a different element, earth, um, earth, water, fire, air, and space. And these elements also um, can be represented by different Sanskrit syllables. Um, so it, I guess if you put my image back or can put on the image, um, it might be reversed, but either way, it's a Sanskrit image that represents um, different vibrations, essentially, of the, the universe itself. So um, there's in many ways a lot of deep and beautiful philosophy and practice um, behind these images too. Uh, it, if you don't mind, actually, I could read one quote. It's kind of deep, <laughs> um, but this is from Kukai. So the founder of the Shingon tradition in Japan, um, he says, the moment that the inner breath and the outer air begin to move, vibration inevitably arises. This is called sound. Vibration always relies on sound. Thus, sound is the source of vibration. Sound arises and is never meaningless. It is always the name of a thing. This is called letter. When the four great elements come into contact, vibration necessarily results. This is called sound. <laughs> the five musical notes of the pentatonic scale, the eight instrumental sounds, the seven Sanskrit grammatical cases, the eight Sanskrit cases endings are all dependent on sound. For sound to name things, letters must be relied upon. Letters arise from the, and have their source in the six sense objects. Um, so again, a lot of symbolism <laughs> within a quote like this, but um, we can sort of see the connections that he creates and describes between these teachings of the elements and these Sanskrit symbols and how it's essentially all coming down to these vibrations and sounds that um, are part of these Buddhist practices behind that imagery. And so um, when Buddhists are chanting these mantras, um, all of these different sounds and syllables in a sense have different meaning to it. And that vibration, um, if you take a moment, for example, and just breathe for a little bit, and that most basic syllable that you just put up was called, was the Sanskrit syllable ah. And so you can either just chant and feel this syllable ah inside you, for example, saying, ah, 
or even just a more quiet. Just taking a deep breath in. And as you take that deep breath out, just feel that air coming through with this basic ah sound. If you try it a couple times, you can just feel, imagine all the good energy coming into you with an in-breath. Then completely relaxing your body with the out-breath. Imagining all that good energy you feel and imagine also going out into the world with that out breath. And so in this way, when we breathe with these little sounds, we can actually use this also as an early device in meditation practices to, to kind of calm the body in different ways or focus on different things. And these different vibrations that we feel um, through chanting a syllable or a basic sound like that. Um, they, they each carry different meanings to them. Um, so they can be different types of focus. But one of the most fundamental of all of these uh, that's said to be is this basic sound, ah. And so this is the, also the representation of the Dainichi, who we talked about earlier, um, who is this, all this pure light and goodness of the world, of the universe. And so in some ways you can, this is one form of meditation too, um, where you can just imagine that light and goodness coming into you or arising in you and also going out into the world around you too as you do these breaths in and out and so in some ways this ah sound is considered the the most fundamental <laughs> of all of these syllables and vibrations and that ah can be one kind of just basic um, little meditation and contemplative devices that is also one way to practice if you don't want to just sit silently to imagine this ah syllable or imagine all this light and goodness and purity um, and to even as an extra option imagine this going out um, around you as well which can which can feel good because <laughs> you're not just um, in a sense jo joy and happiness. It doesn't mean that we have to, it's not like money where if we give money away, we don't have that money anymore. Happiness <laughs> and joy, the more we feel it and the more we share it, it, it doesn't have to be something that is comes from one to another. The more we share happiness, the more we feel happiness ourselves, the more others can feel good around us too. The more we give it away, the more good we can feel too. Um, so in a sense, that's one of these basic teachings that come with such practices as well. Um, I love that. I love that idea of <laughs> your heart can grow, that you, you have infinite uh, aptitude or infinite, infinite room for goodness and yeah. breathing in goodness for yourself, but breathing out, it's what you put out in the world can also be good for the world, for other people. No, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had a, a comment from Z uh, on YouTube. I don't have time to breathe, but <laughs> oh, isn't, no. isn't that the reason that people are drawn to visiting temples and practicing? I hope you can find some time to breathe. Z. That, that's very typical of many of us in our busy, busy lives, right? Yeah. 
but in some sense, it's one of those things that is the most natural. Uh, of course, we whether we're conscious of it or not, we have to be breathing every moment of every day um, in order to stay alive. Okay. So, so doing it right and doing it with a deeper meaning. I love that yeah. idea. <laughs> Now, uh, so many things that you see in temples do have these symbols on them. And yes. you gave us an example how just one of them is the sound of breathing. Um, that's something also to, to take in as you're walking around a beautiful temple, right? Yeah. Um, so there is so much deep meaning in all of these symbols, um, like you showed. They, I, I just basically explained one of those Sanskrit syllables at the top, at the bottom of that statue. Um, but in this image of the mandalas you uh, just put up too, there's, um, we can find these images in a lot of temples as well, especially um, Shingon and Tendai temples in Japan. And each one of these figures um, in some other representations of these mandalas, each one of these figures can also be represented by a, a Sanskrit syllable and in a sense, a different vibration. Um, but also each one of these figures, each one of these different Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, uh, can represent a different type of trait um, or thing to be cultivated. And so, for example, one of these halls is called the, the Canon Hall in those mandalas. And there's like 21 different forms of compassion. <laughs> um, so it, it's in some ways a teaching that we can cultivate not just compassion itself, but compassion in different types of scenarios and different types of situations and that different types of compassion might be more appropriate in different situations as well. And so um, kanon uh, in Japanese, uh, some, pe some English speakers are more familiar with the, the Chinese pronunciation guanyin. Um, but this is considered the, the embodiment of compassion. And so there's many representations of Kanon uh, throughout temples. Sometimes you can see uh, ones with many, many different arms. <laughs> uh, so this is called the sen Senju Kanon in Japanese or the thousand armed, thousand hand. Uh, canon. And so this one often it ha can have many heads and many eyes too, because it, there's many, many different kinds of needs, many kinds of suffering in the world, right? And so um, it's a representation of seeing all these different forms, be, raising our awareness um, to see many different types of suffering in the world. And then we can't help every person the same way, right? And so there's many, many different hands uh, to represent the compassion to many different needs in the, in the world, many different tools in each hand uh, to help many different types of people depending on those needs. And so I, in many ways, I think this is a really, really beautiful type of symbol for compassion in that way. Absolutely. And the idea that one one solution does not fit everyone is yeah. an ancient, <laughs> ancient understanding that we need lots of solutions for lots of different problems and lots of different people. It's so interesting, gorgeous. Now let's uh, continue our journey outside mm -hmm. a little bit. You have so many beautiful images of stairs <laughs> yeah, um, this this is one temple in eastern Kyoto. Uh, I, it's not not one of the more famous ones, but I really enjoy it. Um, and this is just a, 
as far as stairways go, they're of course usually straight. And um, this is just one of the more unique rounded staircases um, along the philosopher's path, which is uh, a rather famous walking area in Eastern Kyoto. And um, yeah, there's, as you go along, there's so many temples and places and each with their own unique future uh, features in different ways. I, I enjoy just also <laughs> taking people along and noticing some of these different little special. Well, all the beautiful architecture of the temple buildings and structures themselves is always appealing to people as we visit. So to point out how all the buildings are fitted together without nails and can be taken apart and moved to other yeah. places, which <laughs> did happen over history, right? Yeah. Yeah, and some people are quite surprised at all the weight being held of <laughs> on these structures that, as you say, have not a single nail in them. And yet they've survived through all these huge earthquakes and everything. And so it's some amazing, in some ways, some amazing old technology of building. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this was interesting to me. Uh, people often ask about Zen Buddhism. And I think uh, I asked you as well, and you said, how many years do you have? <laughs> Zen Buddhism understanding, of course, is a very, very deep subject. Um, but are we looking at kind of a Zen rock or sand garden here? Yeah, I mean, it, this is actually technically a Pure Land temple, but <laughs> they, um, these types of gardens did get more popularized in the Zen temples and Zen tradition. Um, right, there are they are gardens. But um, the may rather than flowers or something like that, where we often think of in the West and English speaking countries and places, um, in some of these Japanese gardens, they are mostly rocks or sand that make up the basis of the, uh, the garden or a particular space within the garden. And um, as you saw, there, there's often a lot of ripples created into it. Sometimes there can be um, a particular sort of island of moss and little things in the middle. And they can almost, in a sense, look and represent um, like little islands in the water. And the, the way the rocks and sand are raked uh, represents these different ripples inside the water. And in some ways, the impermanence through that water and the constant changing of the patterns that they rake into it, um, that things are always changing in life. I think that another great philosophy for life, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. How things are always changing and the, the beauty of simplicity. Yeah. Right? Looking at such a simple design and getting deeper meaning or even just getting enjoyment from simplicity is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Now, one of the symbols uh, you talked about is it looks like a wheel. It looks like a sailing ship, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, instead of flipping these around on a ship, we, we often see these in imagery of temples. And this is actually one of the most famous teachings in Buddhism uh, called the Eightfold Path. So um, if we usually count around these spokes in that kind of image, there's eight of them there. And so these are, in some sense, no, although there's many, many different Buddhist traditions, every one of them goes back to this eightfold path and what is called Four Noble Truths, which is actually the first part um, of the eightfold path as well. Uh, what is called right view. 
And so Buddhist philosophy in many ways is very embodied, very practiced from moment to moment. So just as an example of what is in these folks, right view uh, is said in the Buddhist texts um, to be this view of life and the view moment to moment of these four noble truths, which are um, suffering or stress, but then there's actions or um, things to do with each of these so-called noble truths. So if we recognize suffering or stress, what's the action or the contemplation with that? Um, it is to examine it fully, uh, to really look at it and observe it in depth. And so we come to an understanding of that suffering or that stress. Uh, this leads to the second noble truth, which is the origin of that suffering, <laughs> the origin of that point of stress. And so um, what's the action or the thing to do with that is to let that go. Um, there can be many ways to let it go. It's not always easy, but to find that way to let that go. Um, we can't do that without first being aware of it and finding the, the cause. But once we do that, trying to let that go. And that leads to this third um, noble truth, uh, which is the, um, the cessation of that stress or suffering. And so uh, once we let that go, we see, oh, that feels a little better now. <laughs> um, and so we observe then that difference and see how things have changed and see oh, this is how we came to this point. So in some ways, we're slowly learning and learning um, our minds better at how we um, release ourselves from different stressors in our life and in the world. And then we go back to um, this Eightfold Path, um, which includes other daily habits of things like right action and right, <laughs> right speech in the world, right thought, um, right livelihood, right effort, uh, right mindfulness, right concentration. And so in many ways, it's kind of like creating a positive feedback loop as we turn this wheel more and more in our daily life from moment to moment, because the more that we go through this process of seeing, oh, okay, this is, this is a point of stress, but we, if we can actually face it in, and be aware of it and look at it, understand it, then that's when we are able to let that go and um, move on in life. And this ends up creating deeper awareness of our, within our mind, of our actions, of our speech um, in daily life as well. And so the even when sitting in practice, um, if you try this in a meditative practice as well, um, for example, something as simple as taking some deep breaths and realizing now that I'm coming to a deeper awareness of my body, I have a little bit of a pain in my back. <laughs> I examine it more. The side, with the first step leading to the second. Oh, and I see the source. That's because my posture isn't so great right now. Okay, well, let me fix that a little. <laughs> and then I see, oh, it feels a lot better. <laughs> this, this, this stress, this little physical stress that created some mental tension as well. Um, now it's gone. 
And so then I can focus better <laughs> on these other aspects. So that just even moment to moment like that, um, even with subtle things, realizing um, if you're focusing on the breath too, at what points does breathing deeper maybe, or breathing more shallow, or breathing longer or shorter, we can just see what effects those have um, from moment to moment. Even if you're, whether you're sit, trying to sit in silent meditation or just breathing while doing something like washing the dishes or um, sweeping the floor, cleaning the floor. Um, all of these can be little moments of practice where we look inside ourselves and see, oh, just breathing this different way helps me relax a little more, a little more deeply. And the more we go through this process, seeing, oh, yes, this is a, a little point of stress and suffering, whether physically or mentally in the day, and looking at the cause of that and trying to release that, then our focus becomes deeper. And so we become aware of more. And then we're able to face and deal with more because we're aware of it. And so again, it's like a positive feedback loop that can continue and continue in deeper and better ways as we grow in our awareness of what's going on in our mind. And then in then we are able to face that and let it go. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this is just one little deeper aspect of the, the contemplations that are available within this, all of this symbolism that you can see. Yeah, it's wonderful. And so this idea of contemplation and how you think of yourself, even your breathing, how you're feeling. Um, I think we lose sight of it in our busy lives, right? Yeah. Um, I also love seeing the middle symbol, uh, which <laughs> you often see at the end of roof tiles in temples yeah. and even houses in Japan, right? Is yeah. that the, the concept of balance? Like the um, yang three? It, it can have many different meanings in some ways. So. Um, these three, depending on the school of Buddhism in some ways. Um, so for example, it can be in some places described as these three practices I mentioned earlier of um, voice, uh, of essentially body, uh, voice, and mind. So purifying ourselves physically, vocally, and mentally all at once. Um, but three can also be something like Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, um, which even in itself, um, you might see mo many people going into a temple and bowing three times. And that's often also this Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha but there's these internal meanings to that as well. So it can be the Buddha is the awakening and the potential for awakening within ourselves. And so um, again, Buddha, it just seem, simply means awakened one. So anyone can be awakened. And so it's that potential for awakening within ourselves and anyone. Dharma is that the teachings for that. Um, and Sangha, the third one, is the community of people who uphold and carry on those teachings through generations of life. So um, these three points <laughs> can actually have a lot of different meanings and interpretations. Buddhism is full of these little lists um, and three is a really common number. <laughs> so 
the explanations can vary from time to time as well. Yeah, wonderful. There's so much here. And Nathan, I I'm apologize. We're asking you to simplify such deep, deep concepts. But I think this often happens with visitors, right? They they don't have the time or the energy or, you know, to spend years in, but they want to understand sure. a little bit. And I think that's so positive about sustainable travel. They are really interested, but it is very difficult, I, I imagine, to explain simply, right? Yeah, but <laughs> at least um, with, with time to go a little more in depth with people, then we can share a little more of this deeper meaning involved. But I, I think hopefully allow people to have those moments to to take a breath and <laughs> really stop and let those experiences settle in for a little bit. Um, not, not rushing through, but taking yeah. your time when you visit temples and, and shrines in Japan to notice these details and to notice these small things and think about how it can affect you. I, I love this. Uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. Another beautiful spot. I love that the combination of nature and the beautiful architecture of a temple yeah. uh, is one of the best combinations when you're traveling in Japan, right? Is yeah. this in Kyoto? Um, this is technically just a, about a 15, 20 minute ride from Kyoto Station. Um, so just as close as some of the temples in Kyoto, but technically the next city over to the east called o Otsu, uh, a temple called Ishiyama Dera, um, or Ishiyama Temple, which literally means stone mountain temple. <laughs> um, as you can see in that picture, a very fitting meaning too. So beautiful. Um, there are so many places outside of the main top sites that everybody thinks they have to go see. Um, are there any other places that you would recommend or just wandering around your sure. nearby area in Kyoto, you'll find some beautiful places, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, there's hundreds of temples throughout Kyoto, um, but those are those are some. Ishiyama Dera just outside is an incredibly beautiful place. Um, the one we showed earlier, Arashino Nembutsuji. And there's one just to the north of, oh, um, this one as well. Uh, it, sorry, <laughs> Ninaji. Um, Ninaji is just kind of in the, around the north, bordering the northern mountains of Kyoto. And it's, Ninaji is uh, another UNESCO World Heritage Site itself, but not one that quite as many people go to. Um, but just behind it is this long, beautiful hiking path in the mountains that's actually representative of a famous pilgrimage in Japan, the 88 Temple Pilgrimage in Shikoku. And so there's 88 stops along the way of this uh, little hike that you can do instead of like a couple months, like the one in Shikoku ta may take, um, this one you can do in a day or a couple hours. And it's still a beautiful hike up through the mountains near this temple um, with all these little stops along the way. And so, um, you can either do that as a relaxing, beautiful hike itself or with the different contemplations and prayers or mantras along the way. Um, so you can do it in a number of different styles depending on your, your feelings and interests. But either way, it's a little beautiful hike that not many people know about. <laughs> Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, like you mentioned with Shikoku and the 88 temples, a lot of people spend months doing that. Um, yeah. But there are even some rooms like in Daishoin where they have the 88 temples in one room with the sand from underneath each temple represented there. Uh, this beautiful hike you mentioned in Kyoto, you'll often see references uh, to those as, as a way kind of something you want to do before you die, right? 
<laughs> your bucket yeah. list things. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nathan. We have run out of time. It is an hour. I'm sure we would love to have you back and uh, talking about more places and more ideas and concepts to consider as you visit beautiful shrines and temples in Japan. I wish you the best and the end of year and a wonderful 2024. Thank you so much, Nathan, for joining. Thank you very much, too. <laughs> it's always wonderful to see and talk with you. And I think your That's concepts good. of mindfulness and and how to not only experience these temples, but how to even breathe. These are concepts mm -hmm. you can do wherever you are around the world as we're finishing one year and starting another, right? Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, the breath is a little microcosm of that. So we that breath and have that moment transition into the new, <laughs> the new breath itself. So and how soon. you happy new year happy, <laughs> happy new, new year breath. yeah and so as we're turning into a new year take in that that good energy to yourself but also give out the good energy to others i love that concept happy new year happy new breath <laughs> yeah i love it thanks so much everyone for joining wonderful questions and comments today again and uh we'll see you next year take care everyone Take care, best wishes. Thank you, Nathan. Some of us seem to be stuck under a black cloud. Some of us wonder if it's ever gonna rain. And you all seem like such nice people. Has anyone seen the guy?